I want to continue this morning, and uh, last week uh, we, we broke down and we looked at uh, partially of the life of David, okay, and we talked about King David as an apostolic forerunner, okay, this is a big title, for kingdom living, okay, and I want to continue in that today, and I, I just, you know, when Waylon Henderson was here, it's been about um, three or four weeks ago, and I, I've given it, when people prophesy to us, and when people prophesy to our church, um, and, and I know that they're proven, they have proven prophetic gifts, and uh, even when I don't know if they have proven prophetic gifts, I really uh, look into their words, I pray over their words, and and uh, and I dissect those things, and I look at them, and and I've been doing that with Wayland's word to us as a church, and to myself and Jamie, and um, you know, and and I, and I want to teach into that a little bit, and even just further prophesy out of those words, Amen. And uh, so this is part two of what we began last week, and um, you know, one of the things that Wayland prophesied to us. Uh, to myself and Jamie and us as a church, it th is that there is a forerunner anointing upon you. And uh, so I may just go buy a new Toyota because <laughs> it's a prophetic act to get a forerunner. Jamie's just looking at me like it's not happening, right? <laughs> um, no, my Prius is great and my Highlander is great. So, um, but I'm just making sure y'all were awake. It woke her up, right? But, uh, you know, when there's a... When there's a forerunner anointing and it, it, you know, you see something that's coming. And we talked about this last week. You see something that in the kingdom that God desires and it's not here yet, but you see it. And not only do you see it, not only do you prophesy about it, but for people who are forerunners and churches that are forerunners, they begin to become a catalyst to see a shift come. Amen. And it's just an anointing that God gives that, you know, that they live in such a way and that anointing, that presence that they press into, it causes the desire of God to begin to manifest. Amen. And so, you know, the Lord said there's a forerunner anointing here. And, and so... There's something that we're doing and something that we're living for that's causing the kingdom to manifest in greater measure in our midst. And I say we because that's all of us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And as we look into some things today, you're going to see that when, when God begins to do something and He begins to draw a company of people together, it produces something powerful that causes the kingdom to begin to manifest in the geographic region in a greater way. Yeah. Amen. That's a long sentence, right? I was just saying that thinking, man, I'd hate to write all that down. But, um, you know, and there, are many, there are many forerunners in the Word. Jesus was a forerunner, right? He, he, he came and He brought the kingdom and He stepped into something so that the rest of us could experience that, right? He, he became a forerunner of a new way to live, of a, of a, 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 a man living in righteousness, right? He was man, he was God, but he was man. He lived as a man, interacting with the Holy Spirit, right? Um, and, and moving in the power. He became that forerunner for us. And there were other forerunners in the kingdom. You know, David, we talked about David and last week, and that David saw something, and, and David actually set up his tabernacle, right? And that's a foundational thing for many of us here that, you know, he took the Ark of the Covenant, he set a tent up uh, around it, appointed worshipers, intercessors, uh, musicians, and for 24-7, for that period of time, uh, that they something that the, the law didn't allow, and those of us who've been reading through the scriptures on the Bible app, you know, hallelujah, we are through Leviticus. Aren't you glad? Right? I've heard that some are just watching the videos and the cartoons. Not naming any names, but, but uh, you know, those are really good, right? Who doesn't love a cartoon, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, they, this, that wasn't allowed at that moment, but David saw something that the Lord wanted to do. And, and he, he pulled, right, that, that he pulled the New Testament 
into the old covenant. And it became about presence, and we looked at that all last week. And, and that's part of how David's life became a, a prophetic blueprint for how the church was to function. Now, you know, and so, you know, God's in the midst of restoring the tabernacle of David, yes, yes. right, in this moment in history, in this moment in the church, so that all the Gentiles can come, right? right? Aren't you glad that all the Gentiles can come? Yes. Right? I think any here Jewish background, right? No, but, but we can come because the tabernacle of David is being restored. Now, uh, there are other things as well that, um, that Wayland prophesied about, that uh, this blueprint of David and his life. And, you know, one of the things that Wayland prophesied to Jamie and myself, and, and here's the reality. And as you look at David's mighty men, and I touched on this already, but... Um, you know, in David's mighty men, even though some stayed and guarded the baggage at some point and the bags and all the goods and others went to war, guess what? Everybody got to share in it. Amen. Right? And so the thing is, when, you know, a prophet gives a word like that to somebody in the body and it gives to, to leadership, the reality is you guys get to live in that. Amen. You, you get the goods. You get the spoils, right? And so one of the things that Waylon prophesied is that he said, you are go talking to Jamie and myself, he said, I see both of you going forth as David did with the sword. And he said, basically, that you're going to cut off the head of a Goliath in our region. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That sounds fun, except sometimes when you're facing Goliath. Right, but but Goliath speaks of those principalities that are in a region, and um, you know, let's think about Goliath for a minute. Now, when you know the children, the Israelites were in, you know, going into battle, and Goliath, he's this principality, and he just stood and opposed and mocked, yep. wow. and everybody was afraid. And no one wanted to take it on. No one had courage to go forward and, and face him. And, and David was, because he was so young, he was probably just dumb enough to take him on. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to be dumb and young and inexperienced, right? <laughs> but, but he went with the sword of the Lord, and he's like, dude, you've mocked long enough. Hallelujah. Right? And, and he went, and let's just, let's just turn, let's turn there to 1 Samuel 17. Because the Lord's saying something. Amen. 1 Samuel 17, and you guys know the story well, but let's just look in verse 50. And he's, you know, he's, he's, he's slung his stone. Goliath has fallen to the ground, you know. Um, and it's, you guys have probably heard this before, but you know, when you literally, when, usually when you get hit in the head with a stone, you don't fall forward. You get knocked backwards, but uh, there may have been a large angel or the hand of the Lord, I don't know, but he stood behind. Even if David had missed, uh, he was going down and he went forward. And so in verse 50 it says, Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw uh, th that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley uh, and the gates of Ekron. Now, here's what happens. When, when you take down principalities that produced fear and mockery and intimidation, guess what happens? people that have been living under that thing come out from under it, right? And the unbelief, the fear, the intimidation, the mockery, that gets dealt with. And suddenly, 
suddenly, now there's, there's more than a suddenly, there's a suddenly, but there's a process also. People start coming out from under that and they're like, why was I letting that thing keep me in unbelief? Why was I letting that thing keep me from moving forward? Right? Because sometimes principalities are in your face and sometimes you don't know they're in your face, but you're living under something that's kept you in bondage. And so people start moving out of fear and intimidation and, and, and they start moving out from under that mocking spirit and that thing of hopelessness that's tried to work. Now those things have ruled this geographic region too long. It's just been too long. And uh, do you feel a trembling? Do you feel a shifting in the atmosphere? Uh, you know, there, there have been periods of time where we would come into worship and everybody wanted to be quiet. Why was that? Because there was something of fear and intimidation in the atmosphere. Right? But there's something. There is a shaking and a trembling because principalities that have been standing against the kingdom of God are being dealt with. Right? And, and, and you know what? And, and without saying too much, you know, Dwayne and I were talking about this. This thing of mockery that's been in our region and it's mocked the move of God. It's mocked the supernatural. Right? It's mocked that. And, and, and it's made people try to think about past failures and, and things that didn't work. That thing is being dealt with. Yeah. And we're in a season where people are coming out from under that. Amen. Now, there, there are suddenlies in that, but there are also elements of spiritual warfare that are very important. Now, Spiritual warfare, when you say that, it just brings up a lot of different feelings and emotions and, and beliefs and opinions, okay? And, uh, you know, I, I believe there's a dynamic. Of course, if, if you're an apostolic, prophetic people and a church and all that, whether you like the term spiritual warfare or not, you're going to do spiritual warfare. It's part of your DNA. Now, spiritual warfare... Um, hear me now, and I'm not criticizing any of these things. It's more than blowing a shofar. Now, that can be a prophetic act, okay? It's more than flying your freak flag, okay? And God sometimes asks us to do those things. As an, so if you have a shofar and a freak flag, blow it, wave it. We've got them. You know, I, I am all for it, okay? But often the way that you deal with strongholds is there has to be not only a demonstration of the glory and power of God, but there has to be preaching and teaching that unravels systems of unbelief and dysfunctional behavior, right? Because a stronghold, yeah, there's a reality of, of a demonic thing, but strongholds are generally in thought patterns and belief systems in people's lives, right? And God wants to deal with that. And if you look and see where great trans... First, before I'm going to get ahead of myself, but let's turn to... Got to read Scripture, right? 2 Corinthians 10. Right. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. And this is a familiar Scripture. Uh, but the reality is, and we talked about this a lot in GHSSM and you know, strongholds, their ways of thinking that we have to overcome. Sometimes we don't even know that we have a stronghold in our thinking because it's just how we've always thought, right? And I, I, you know, Rodney Hogue, I, I love the example that Rodney Hogue uses where he had a family member that was a farmer. Some of you guys have heard me use this, but that farmer would go out to feed his cows and he'd done it so much there were, there were ruts in the pasture, and he'd get in his truck, and he didn't even have to steer, right? Because that, that truck would just stay in that rut and go down that road without him even having to steer or think about it. And sometimes that what, that's what happens with a stronghold. We've thought in a way, in a belief system, in a pattern so long that we, our mind just goes down directions, and we, we have no control. We don't even have to steer because the devil's like, ha, you have ruts in your mind, and I'm just going to lead you down it. But then 
truth starts coming, right, a paradigm might start shifting and actually knock that truck out of the ruts and you're like, what do I do now? Right? There's something that's shifting. And so that's, you know, there's the, a dealing of strongholds. So let's read this in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. And it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Amen? So when we're talking about that, strongholds, those are the mindsets of people in a particular region. Okay? And the mindset, those are fortified places that keep out truth and hold in lies. Now, it can be, you know, individual you know, a, a stronghold is like, well, I just, I can't trust people, right? And my dad was a creep, and so um, I can't trust, depending on what's happened to you, I can't trust men. Wow. Or I can't trust authority, right? Those are, those are mindsets. And then there are mindsets even in sometimes cities or regions, yeah. you know, uh, that, that, or cultures, Right? We have Oklahoma culture. Or we have American culture. That, you know, y'all have culture. You know, bless God, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. We are all united in our independence and rebellion. Right? I love... Dr. Sam Matthews once, he was, in, he was in the United Kingdom and he was talking to a lady and she said, so how are all the colonies doing these days? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, some of our British friends, they can give us an interesting perspective on American independence, right? So, you know, spiritual warfare actually involves demolishing mindsets so that can, people can not only receive the truth, but so that they can walk in it, yes. right? And, and strongholds, they keep people from the knowledge of God and they prevent people from obeying the truth and the result is ignorance yep. and rebellion. And so as God l releases an anointing for warfare, yes, there is that, uh, that thing where we're, we're dealing with principalities and powers, we're, we're lifting up the high praises of God. Because how many know prayer, warfare, worship, those are powerful things, but truth and the preaching and teaching of truth will shift that. Why do we have a generation now that many think it's okay for a child right before birth to be aborted and that's okay? Or some even saying, well, if they're born and the doctor and the mom decide they don't want it to live, it's okay too. That's a belief system that's been sown for generations. And not only have we allowed it, we've tolerated it. And it's brought us to this point that there is a stronghold in people's thinking. Right? So, do we need some of these strongholds to be unraveled? Yes. But is it going to take mind shifts and changes even in the culture to deal with some of these things? Absolutely. So, you know, we have to move in that. And even when you see in Scripture when, um, when there, were, there were cities and movements and, 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 and great transformation occurred, generally, I'm not saying God can't do it, but generally it was a, a process, okay? You see that, you know, Antioch, I've, I've talked a lot about uh, the Antioch church. And, uh, you know, Antioch... Um, when we might call it an apostolic center because of what it became. And it became a teaching and equipping center where many leaders were taught, equipped, and strengthened, right? And, and the teaching training element was so important. And it became a mission and revival hub where many were taught the word of the Lord by many different people. Wow. Amen. Then you see in Ephesus, okay, 
And, and uh, Paul goes in in Acts chapter 19. Again, great. One of my favorite chapters in the Word where Paul goes into, uh, in Ephesus, uh, Acts 19 to, um, to the city of Ephesus. And, you know, he greets a group of like 12 men. And he was like, well, have you, have you ever been baptized in the Spirit? And they're like, we don't even know what that is, you know. And uh, so they all get filled with the Spirit, right? And they, they, and that, they get saved, they get baptized, filled with the Spirit. And then Paul goes to the synagogue. They don't receive what he says. So he begins to teach in the school of Tyrannus for two years. And it says that all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. In Ephesus, that was uh, one of the... <laughs> The cities where, I believe it was at Artemis or Diana, where that, that temple was, and it was the center of idolatry. And Paul just didn't go, I bind thee, queen of heaven. Now, maybe he did behind the scene. <laughs> right? You know, but he began to teach and preach and release an equipping anointing to the point that after two years... God began to do unusual things. Let's look at that, right? Let's turn to um, Acts chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. Um, yeah, and that's what I just said. Let's read verse 10. And this took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. All in Asia heard the word of the Lord without social media. <laughs> he didn't even have to do a Facebook Live video. He didn't even add to his story. Right? <laughs> but Now, those things are good. I'm not against social media. I, man, I, I love it. Right? But it's like anything. It's a tool that can be used. And so, but what was the result of, of this teaching and equipping that happened over two years? The next verse said, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. So through, not only did Paul bring a shift to Christianity, but it was a shift of a supernatural culture where people were getting healed and delivered by the power of God in unusual ways. Right? We joke about this. You know, we're like, oh, the extraordinary miracles. Well, give me some ordinary. I'm okay with that. Right? But give me extraordinary too. And such, such crazy stuff started happening that even some of the, the Jewish exorcists, right, they tried to, tried to cast some stuff out without knowing Jesus. And they thought, this, this name of Jesus thing is working. Let's try it. It did not go well for them. Right? They got beat up so bad that they didn't even have any clothes on. That's a beating. If you get beat till you're naked, <laughs> that is bad, right? I don't want that kind of beating. But, but even that produced something because it said that the fear of the Lord fell on the whole region. Because suddenly they're like, there's something to this Jesus thing, right? And, and this power of God, this supernatural culture that came because of preaching, teaching, equipping took root, and suddenly, suddenly, rapid change began to happen. But there was a process. And they sowed, as Paul sowed, into that region. And I, I tell you guys, even what's happening with the healing rooms right now, I mean, we've had a, you know, we started it just like, We've been wanting to do it for a long time. We started, and it started off good, and suddenly it's just taking, and there's incredible momentum with it. But why it's working is because we've spent years, and then especially the last two years in the supernatural school, that there's been a pouring into people that... I haven't prayed for anybody that's sick the last two times. 
that we've done them. I've been busy prophesying, you know. But there's something, and it, and it, it seems like an overnight shift. But it hasn't been overnight. And I'll even say this, and I'm going to try to say it very nicely. Maybe I better not. We're doing something that other people want to do but haven't been willing to pay the price to do. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, honestly, it sounds really arrogant, but it's humility because if you don't commit to the process and the long-term sewing of things, you know, and not just a flash in the pan... You know, and, and, and I'm not saying, if other people want to do it, praise God. There are more than enough sick people out there that need prayer. But there has to be a process and a sowing and a giving of something. Because how many of you have ever thought, man, I love homegrown tomatoes or corn or okra, and I'm going to go plant a field, and next week I'm going to harvest that. That doesn't work. Now, in America, we want it to work, yeah. right? You know, we get mad if Popeye's didn't open so we can get our chicken. <laughs> See? <laughs> when <laughs> chicken Express is next door, y'all. And <laughs> it's like crack. But uh, <laughs> it's next door. And, uh, but there, there's a process. There's generally a process involved with the suddenlies. Right. And so, um, you know, David dealt with Goliath, okay? But what about the years that David killed the lion and the bear? Hidden away from anybody else. What about the years? That David just worshipped God out tending the sheep. Knowing God, knowing the faithfulness of God. Being faithful and used by God in the small things that no one ever saw. And then suddenly he's thrust on the scene. Right? What about the times that David was hidden away in the cave of Abdullam? Right? He's running for his life from Saul. He has lost favor with his father-in-law. <laughs> no comments on that, right? And, uh, and so he goes and he hides in the wilderness in the cave of Abdullam. One thing that Wayland prophesied to us, he said the dis discontented and discouraged are going to start to come. Right? Now, that's been some of us. That's been some of y'all over the last years. Years ago, probably eight years ago, I was sitting. I'd gone down to Glory of Zion to a conference. I'm sitting in Applebee's. They're on Teasley Lane in Denton. And a lady named Elaine Priestley, if you've been to Glory of Zion, you probably know who Elaine is. And she walks up to my table and she goes, By the way, the Lord says... <laughs> She said, there's going to be an army that gathers around you. And she said, now, y'all don't take this personally. She said, they're going to be discontented, just like David's army. They're, they're going to look like the rejects. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and she said, they're going to gather to you, and they're going to be like David's mighty army. And she said, there's a, there's a call on your life. You're going to move in miracles. You're going to move in signs and wonders. And she goes, I don't know your wife, but she's really prophetic. And she's key in this. And she just stood there at Applebee's and prophesied to me. And I'm just like, hallelujah. And, you know, other words have come like that. And Waylon said, man, the discontented and the discouraged, they're, they're, they're coming. Now, some of them have already come. There's more. Because in the cave of Abdullam, they came and they were rebellious and they were messed up. Right? Woo! Rejoice in your dysfunction. Right? 
But because God was doing something in a hidden dark place that some people were afraid to go, but it was the anointing that drew them in the wilderness. It was the system, and they had to go outside the system. Right, they're preaching to each other across the... Right? The religious system had discouraged and hurt them, and they said, what's going on in the wilderness? What's going on over there in the southeast? Man, we've, ab we've abandoned it and we've moved to veterans. I know, y'all, this is bad. We might not should put this on YouTube. <laughs> no, I don't want to, uh, you know, bless the other churches in town. Hallelujah. I, I, I really am thankful for them, you guys. I really am. Because when, when, when this thing breaks open, we need everybody. Right, but but in the cave of Abdullam, people started gathering, and and you know what's crazy is that, you know, everybody talks about how you know David, um, David killed Goliath. We just talked about it, but did you know that in the Old Testament there were four other people who sl who killed giants, and they were all part of David's David's men, David's army, and so. As, they, as, as there was something of the anointing and the presence of God that began to come, began, people, it produced giant killers. You know, you, you want to, and again, you know, you want, you want to be a giant killer? Hang out with other giant killers. Yeah. You, you, you do that. You go for that. And, and there was a tr an anointing of transformation that began to come. And it began to be released there in the cave of Abdullam. And then suddenly something happened. David leaves Abdullam and he goes to Ziklag. Right? And, and he leaves the cave. God says, okay, it's time to leave the cave. You can go to Ziklag. Now, some bad stuff happened at Ziklag. At one point, there's a raid, and all the women and children and all this stuff get stolen. And so David, why did David, he just goes out and he pursues and he takes everything and he restore, everything gets restored. And that's when the people who, got, who stayed behind to guard the baggage, David came back and basically made a decree and said, okay, this is, you know, you guys get to share in what we just took. You guys get to share in the spoil. And it said it became an ordinance from that day forward in the nation of Israel. So here you've got someone who's not even in the system who's making decrees in the wilderness and it becomes law because there, there is an apostolic unity and alignment that starts coming. And alignment, I like the term alignment because it literally means the brokenness in our lives starts getting repaired. The things that are out of joint, the things that are messed up, as we come into unity, people start getting healed. And it's more than just unity of saying, oh, kumbaya, we're all together. We're coming together for a kingdom purpose. So I'm going to prophesy today that even though we've been in Abdu the cave of Abdullam, we're coming out. Amen. And I don't completely understand this because as I was praying about it this morning and I'd studied these passages of Scripture, and I, I'm, I, I'm just going to say what the Lord said to me and even when it doesn't make sense. Because the Lord said, you're transitioning from Abdullam to Hebron. I'm like, God, wait a minute. David went to Ziklag. And, and even when he went to Ziklag, you know what started happening? Others started coming. But they were trained warriors already. It wasn't just the discontent and the rebellious 
and the disillusioned, it was those who were already trained, knew their place, knew what tribe they were from, from and they began to gather. Yes. And then there was even another transition where David went to Hebron. And he came in and Saul died. And they came and they anointed him as king. And the kingdom shifted. Now, hear me, I'm not saying I'm, I'm a king or going to be king, but I'm saying there's something of the kingdom that began to increase and there was much joy and rejoicing. And that's, let's just read that, what happened at Hebron. Okay? 2 Samuel 2.40. I'm prophesying, y'all. Here's what happened when he was anointed and he went into Hebron before he went into Jerusalem. Well, that's not the right one. There's not a verse 40. The rumors are true. <laughs> I'll look it up later, y'all, I promise. <laughs> but it said when they anointed him that there was much rejoicing and people began to come and bring provision. As they came into Hebron, right... And there was something that began to happen. Great provision, great joy, and suddenly the kingdom went to a new place. Right? I'll look it up, y'all. I'll put it I'll put it on Facebook or somewhere. I'll I'll add it to my story. Right. <laughs> I'll tweet it. And and see who attacks me. Right. <laughs> Right, my influence must be growing. I, I, I'm getting t my own personal trolls on social media. It's great. <laughs> but they came into a place, and in every place, that in every stage, God would draw people, right, and add to a company a mighty army that was coming together, right? We're transitioning. We're crossing over. See why I'm confused? Because I was like, God, we have to go to Ziklag, and, and maybe, I, maybe I misheard. But the Lord said, you're transitioning from Abdullam to Hebron. Okay. Okay. Well, it talks about joy and rejoicing when they, what is it? I was saying the third chapter talks about going to Hebron. Okay. Is it 340? Someone. No. <laughs> Sounds like. <laughs> you in the back, what do you think? No. <laughs> yes, hallelujah. But we're, we're transitioning. Yes, hallelujah. We're transitioning. I mean, it doesn't mean that we won't have challenges. <laughs> have you determined in life that there's always going to be a challenge? There's always going to be a lion or a bear or a Goliath to slay. There's always going to be a Saul to contend with. There's always going to be an Absalom that you have to confront. There's always going to be, have to be moments that you don't go and mess around with Bathsheba. Well, come on. <laughs> There's always going to be challenges in the kingdom. And, you know, years ago, Kathy Matthews, Dr. Sam Matthews' wife, told me that, and we'd been in a difficult moment, and she said, Andy, I'm so sorry. 
so sorry, Sam's been sharing with me some of your challenges. And she said, and I wish I could tell you that this will end someday. She said, but in the kingdom, these things don't end. And I was like, well, thanks for your advice. (laughs) 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 Woo, right? (laughs) But that's from someone who's been doing this for many, many years. Who's been living an apostolic life since the mid-80s. Right? Some of us think this thing just burst onto the scene a couple of years ago. And to some people it did, right? But there have been people who have been living for these things for decades. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. right? And, 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 and there's always going to be those things, but we are transitioning. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. We're coming out of the cave of Abdullam. Yes. Now the good thing about that is when you transition and when you come out of something that God has prepared you in the darkness. He's prepared you in a dark place where you even could have probably killed Saul when he came in because he's relieving himself in the cave and you're like, nope, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. And you come out into a place of apostolic unity and apostolic influence. Can you feel something in the atmosphere that's different? I messaged Waylon and I said, Man, brother, something, something happened when you were here. Yes. And he said, Yes, I felt it. I felt something happening. Right? Because what was his assignment? To come along as a midwife yes. and to help birth what's already, what's already there. Yes. Right? right. It's coming out is what Betty says. Miss Betty says it, right? Right? One way or the other, right, Jennifer? It's coming out. <laughs> Hallelujah. She's, I promise you she's ready. <laughs> she's the one who probably said one way or another he's coming out, right? <laughs> but we're in a moment where the kingdom is coming forth. And because we've said, God, and you know what? We hadn't done it perfect. Aren't you glad that you don't have to do it perfect? Amen. You know, we haven't been perfect. And everybody's like, you're right, you haven't. Yeah. But at the same time, God's just like, I'm just looking for someone, a, a people, wherever I can find them, that'll follow me and say, God, I, I, we want you. God, we want you. We want your kingdom. We want the expression of what you want to do in the earth. And God, we want your presence. We want your glory. God, we love your presence. We'll, we'll, we'll pursue presence. Right? Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with programs. Man, the, the men's breakfast stuff we've been doing, it's been really good. It's been powerful. Right? But in the midst of that, presence and glory is coming forth. And there's something that's causing the kingdom to begin to come in a greater dimension. And as that happens, we all get transformed. And suddenly, broken, rebellious, discontented people in debt, they suddenly start becoming mighty men and women of God. And suddenly... They're prepared to kill a giant or two. Now that sounds great on a Sunday morning. (coughs) Until the giant actually gets in your face. (laughs) My pastor said I could kill you, right? (laughs) Don't call me. No. (laughs) But that's when you realize that it's in you. That the greater one is with you. The defender is standing with you. And he's already been working for your good. And you can sling your stone in obedience. But whatever that, the Jesus is big enough to stand with you. And he's going to knock that thing forward whether you hit it or not. 
Hallelujah. That's a moment that we're in. We're transitioning. We're coming out of Abdullam. Let's stand together. Amen. Let's stand together in His presence. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for, uh, God, just your presence that so came. Just thank you how you've been touching us all throughout this service. And God, I thank you for the glory of your presence. And Father, I thank you for the journey that we've all been on. Father, whether it's been individually or together, whatever. But Father, I thank you at this moment that there's a greater anointing. Lord, it's a moment that you're, you're, t you're bringing us in. Now, it might mean that we come out of some things. It might mean leaving some things behind. But, Father, you're bringing us into a new place. Father, you're bringing into that place uh, of influence, God, because you're with us, God. And we're with you, God. We're with you. God, as, as, you, as you move, we want to move with you. And God, we don't want to miss what you're doing. And Father, I thank you that you're dealing with, with fear. You're dealing with unbelief. You're dealing with intimidation. Father, you're dealing with those principalities that have, have mocked and have even tried to produce mockery in the people of God for decades. But Lord, I thank you that's coming down. And we expect... Father, we raise our expectations for what you're going to do. And God, that it's, in, it's possible in Ardmore, Oklahoma. It's possible in Carter County. Father, that you're dealing with the Oklahoma resistance. Father, you're dealing with that. And Lord, I thank you that Waylon and others have declared, Dr. Sam Matthews and others, and even our, our friend Paul, out of North Carolina, who's a prophet, that they see just a realm of glory and fire as a pillar coming up out of this place. And Father, I thank you that you have st strategically positioned us here between Oklahoma City and Dallas as a hub of revival and awakening. A hub of glory. A hub and a place of revelation, wisdom, and transformation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. Lord, we're not even sure we can express it. But Lord, you're doing it. And Father, I thank you today as, I, as I've declared these things, God, as an intercession, God, that you're even causing a further shift to come into this place in this city, in, in all of our lives. Thank you, God, that it's your grace that's transforming us into a mighty mighty army. Thank you, God. Let Zion be expressed. Let, let your presence, the fullness of your presence and your glory come in a greater way today. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. Father, I thank you that even yokes of, of heaviness and, uh, is just coming off of people today. Father, that there's just heaviness that's coming off of people today. Father God, condemnation. Lord, I just pray that condemnation would even come off of people. Uh, that that they, they would just come into freedom as they experience you, God, in your presence. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you glory. We give you glory today. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Yes. He's so good, man. Man, that was a good word. <laughs> Sometimes you preach things and you're like, wow, I like that. That was good. Thank you, Jesus. Right? <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Amen. Well, go in the glory and the grace of Jesus today, this week. Amen. God's just going to do some good things for people this week. Amen. I just... Just real breakthrough for people. Hallelujah. Amen, Laura. Amen. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Lord. More more for Laura. Amen. More for Laura. More for Mike. 
Amen. Just, Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do even this week. Amen. Lord, thank you more for the Knoxes. Lord, just for the Knoxes. And there's just a whole lot happening over here in this section. Lisa and Betty are like, what about us? Tim's like, what about us? Yeah, yeah, just reach up and get it. There's just, um, and I, I'm just going to prophesy to this section. I don't even know truly what I'm going to prophesy, but um, just that thing of condemnation and, and just almost all of you are in a place where you think, man, I have missed it, right? And the Lord's like, no, you haven't missed it. You haven't missed what I'm doing, amen. And it's, it's a season of breakthrough for all of you. It's a season of breakthrough for all of you. It's a season for healing for all of you. And, and some areas where some of you have got some areas of lack. And I'm not just talking about money, but you're very aware of your lack. And the Lord's just saying, I'm meeting the lack in this season. And I, I'm just going to say for all of you that you'll have significant breakthrough in this week. Now, you know, that doesn't mean I'm ignoring the rest of y'all, but I just, there's something in this section, right? There's, there's, um, there's a breakthrough for all of you and, and Hannah, right? Hannah, I think the Lord's going to answer some of your questions this week. And I think you've had some questions that you hadn't even expressed to your mom and dad. And, and there's some things that you've really held to your heart, and you're just like, God, why? Why? You've had a lot of unanswered whys. And the Lord's really heard those things, right? He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't ignored you. He hasn't, he hasn't been quiet, right? He's been present, and he's waiting. This is a season where he's going to answer your questions, right? Just not even from personal trauma, but I think even from some of the questions you have about future and destiny, all how that's all tied into career and all those things, the Lord's really going to open that up this week. And, and so um, pay attention to some of the dreams that the Lord's going to give you. And, and I think there's a significant visitation that's coming to you this week. So um, just open up your heart to that. It's not because you've been closed, because you've really poured your heart out to the Lord, and you've really, really um, asked Him many things, and uh, He's really faithful, and he, he loves your heart, and He's not scared of your questions, okay? So don't be afraid to ask Him, but He's going to show you how present He was, and how present He is, and how present He's going to be, amen? Does that make any sense? Okay. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, breakthrough. Amen. Breakthrough. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. All right. Have a great week. Um, stay flu-free, if possible. Hallelujah. Yeah, we declare health healing. Now, if you have need of prophetic ministry, am I on the prophetic team today? Okay. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Prophetic teams here and teams for physical healing here. Amen. Praise God. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.